Perimedska, you are a computer security expert, you are a cryptographer, cypherpunk, and you have great insight into the vulnerabilities of our devices. So what are five tips that you would give people to increase their privacy and security going into the new decade? Uh, computer security people, almost all of them you'll find do this following same things. Almost every computer security person is obsessive about installing operating system and software updates as soon as they become available. I have my computer and my phone set to automatically install updates, but sometimes I get to it before the automatic process goes. <laughs> and why do you do this? The biggest threat you face is that vulnerabilities that are found in your operating system will be, ex will be remotely exploited by people attempting to take over your machine. As soon as the manufacturer, as soon as Apple or, or, or Microsoft or whoever publish an update along with a list of the vulnerabilities that it fixes, the people out there whose job, whose profession uh, is breaking into very large numbers of computers will analyze the patches that Microsoft or Apple has and develop vulnerabilities to exploit them to go after the people who haven't patched yet. Mm. Um, so you really want to patch very, very fast. I usually patch within hours. One of the biggest fears that people have is, well, what if there's a bug in this update? You know, software needs to be tested. It's true that every once in a while you'll have a little bit of trouble because you update, but you will have much, much more trouble if you don't update. You are not going to be able to make the judgment on whether the patch is ready better than Microsoft or Apple can. If Apple thinks it's ready for your device, you should put it onto your device. Certainly don't say to yourself, oh, this is irritating. Why are they bothering me with this stuff? I don't want to do this. I don't like the new operating systems look so much. What they're basically saying is, I want someone in Moldova to take over my computer. And if you, if you don't patch, that is basically what you're saying. And also, by the way, eventually almost all computers go out of support. You know, if you have a sufficiently old Mac or a sufficiently old iPhone or Android device, you can no longer get patches. And at that point, you should get a new computer. And I know that's bothersome and it costs money, but if you have, you know, a very old iPhone and you're running a very old version of iOS, your phone will be easily broken into. Part of being an owner of a modern digital device is understanding it has a lifetime. And, you know, and I know lots of people who say, why can't they support my phone forever? It was working perfectly well before, you know, it's planned obsolescence, blah, blah. I think it's very, very hard to support many, many models of old equipment with, with new operating systems. So that means if your phone goes out of support, if your laptop goes out of support, get a new one so that you can run the latest operating mm -hmm. system. I've spoken to people who, who are on the elderly side and have said to me that, that they don't feel comfortable with the new version of the operating system, that when they update, often they get confused. Just as at some point you might feel too old to drive a car, there might come a point where you are too old to keep your computer operating safely and that might be the point to talk to the grandkids by phone uh, and, uh, and, and, and not have a laptop that you're using for most such purposes mm -hmm. anymore. All right, next tip. Back your computer up. Um, many people are really terrible about this and there's no reason for it in the modern world. Your phone, your laptop, all of these things in, in, in mo with modern operating systems can back themselves up automatically. If you don't take the time to set that up, and it only takes a few minutes at some point, then one day your computer will crash, the hard drive will crash, the SSD will crash, and you will not have any of your data anymore. And talk about this from a computer security point of view. Why is that also important? Oh, well, because, you know, at some point, if someone breaks into your computer, you would, and, you know, and wrecks a bunch of stuff, you would like to get a version of your data and your software from months ago before this happened, or there are times when people's machines are the subject of malware that encrypts their hard drive and pops up a message saying, if you don't send Bitcoin to this address, you'll, you know, you'll never see your data again, twirling mustache. <laughs> um, and if you have backups, then you can say, you know, screw you, you know, wipe your computer out, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, restore it from the backup and then move on with your life. Our next tip is about passwords. What have you got to say about that? Don't use the same password on any two services you work with. 
and because you probably use hundreds of services and no human being can remember the you know hundreds of different passwords what you should do is get a program called a password safe which is a program that stores all of these hundreds of passwords you use and you use a single password to unlock it the important reason you want to do this is that in intervals people steal the password files for various online services and crack all the passwords on them. And then what they do is they try using those account names and passwords on other services. And so what every professional you will talk to does is we never use the same password on two services. We use password safes. And don't even just modify a tiny bit of your password because it's easy enough to crack after. Yeah, people, uh, yeah well, people, people often think, oh, my password is extremely clever. No one is ever going to crack this. And the problem is, it doesn't matter how good your password is when people are trying billions and billions of passwords a second to see if it corresponds mm -hmm. to yours. You're not that good. Um, and, and it's not worth it. It's, it's really cheap and easy to use a password safe. And you also have something to say about this advice, like don't write down your passwords. You disagree with this entirely. Oh, oh yeah. Think about what your threat model is. If your threat model is that your spouse is going to find out what your password is to your account, um, and you know, and get mad at what they find and divorce you, maybe writing it down and leaving it in the desk is a bad idea. The model that you have to keep in your mind isn't that someone is going to break into your house and look for your passwords. Usually the model you have to worry about is that someone is going to crack millions of accounts from somewhere else and, is, and won't take the time. That's a real significant threat. That's something people do every day. So what you're saying is that it's far more likely that someone is going to remotely try to crack these passwords, that someone is going to be physically in your house. Right. But an easy fix if you do write it down is why not keep a password book but keep it in a safety deposit box or keep you, it somewhere secure? You can, you can do that. You can keep it in your home safe. But as I said, generally speaking, I tell people to use these programs called password safes. Right. Your next tip has to do with multi-factor authentication. So what is that? Anytime you need more than, you know, more than the password, you need some sort of code that varies with time or some other sort of mechanism in addition to your password, that's called multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is great because it means that simply stealing someone's password is insufficient. You have to be in possession of a device like their cell phone or a device that they've bought like a YubiKey. There are various different types of multi-factor authentication. Some are much better than others. So walk us through those. Well, the worst kind of multi-factor authentication you can use is SMS-based, mm -hmm. where you get a, a code texted to you from the company. And this is bad because it is very straightforward to call up your cell phone carrier and say, you know, I am Mr. John Smith and I have lost my cell phone and bought a new one. Uh, please to transfer telephone number to me. And of course, you know, the idiots at the cell phone companies always do. And also sometimes you can have malicious people working inside the cell phone companies that, that are true. being paid to port numbers as well. Yes. So be careful and stay away from SMS authentication. What are some other types? Well, there are these programs like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator or what have you that do basically the same thing. They present a code that's good to you for every account that's good for 60 seconds. And you enter in your password and you enter in the six digit code and then you're in your Facebook account. This is substantially superior to SMS. There are other uh, even you know harder core ways of doing this. There are companies that make these little gadgets uh, that will store your time-based authenticator codes or, or other or, 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 or things like U2F codes and you don't really even care what those are. But the point is you can buy devices from YubiKey and you can buy devices from Google and other companies so that if you don't trust your cell phone especially, that gives you a slightly better piece of security than just having the application running on your cell phone. And if you use one of those things, then even if someone steals your password, you're pretty safe. So the combination of all of these things together, you know, gives you, it, it doesn't make you perfectly secure. It's very hard to be perfectly secure, but it certainly means that, 
you know, that, that you're ahead of the pack. If you're faster than the other gazelles, the cheetah will not go for you. They'll go for someone else. Our final tip has to do with the inherent insecurity of SMS and email. And Snowden actually tweeted about this recently. He said that he doesn't ever use email. He doesn't use SMS. He only uses Signal because it's far more secure. So if people are going into the new decade, maybe they should change their habits and try to use things like Signal more often. Signal itself is pretty good. Uh, it's probably not perfect. It's certainly a hell of a lot better than SMSs, which go out in the clear, uh, or email, which is usually not encrypted. You know, usually email is, uh, is, is, is a relatively insecure means of communication. And the more routinely you even discuss things like your grocery lists over Signal, the less strange it becomes when you're using services like this for communication, mm -hmm. and the less that it, sh that it indicates that something unusually secure is being said when you, know, when you actually do need to say something that requires safety. The more routinely you encrypt all your communications, the less it flags as special any given communication that that actually is special. Mm -hmm. And the more people who use these services, uh, the easier it is for people to hide amongst them. It's important uh, as, as a good citizen, mm -hmm. I think, uh, to use encrypted communication services, even if you don't particularly feel that, that you have anything to hide because you're protecting people who do. And, and I think that that's a public spirited thing to do. Well, thank you so much, Perry. These are fantastic tips. If you are someone who is trying to protect their privacy more or protect the security of their devices, you should absolutely be starting with these five things. Obviously, there are more things you can be doing, but for an average person, this is more than they're doing currently, and you, they're essential things as part of your day-to-day -day living. So thank you so much for your time. It's been great chatting with you. Well, thank you very much for having me.